So what does it take? What would need to be present for us to be able to take control of some of these processes? Um, one would be a way to initiate or override actions, right? Like there's got to be some way that we can prevent ourselves from just driving right past the gas station or um, with the stick shift example I was giving in the last segment, um, it takes a second after you go from a stick shift car to an automatic to stop. When you hear the car getting to a certain rev, stop picking up your left foot and trying to stomp on the, on the um, clutch. Uh, it's kind of, I remember when I would rent a car when I was driving stick, um, I would rent a, an automatic and I wasn't familiar with driving automatics, which seems like it would be way easier, but I would be like kind of trying to stomp on the brake when I'd hear the engine revving. And it's like, um, cause there's no clutch to stomp on. And, uh, but you gotta have a way to override that. And um, your brain can say, don't lift up foot. This is not a stick, right? A way to represent the unconscious goals, the, the conscious brain's agenda, you know, you have to figure out a way to represent the goals and the agenda, um, that you want to pursue, right? You have to be able to figure, you know, be able to um, recognize what those are. You need information about the different inputs that you're experiencing, like which ones are important, which ones can be ignored, which ones are relevant to what I'm trying to do. Um, things about like that. And then information about the state of our mental processes. Like, am I accomplishing this task in a smooth way? Um, is there maybe a better way that I could be approaching this problem? Um, so we have to check in with ourselves periodically and make sure that we're actually um, processing the information as efficiently as we can. Now, as a student, I think some of this stuff would be super relevant to you. Um, I will tell an unflattering story on myself, which is that I had really terrible study habits when I entered college. I had no idea how to um, facilitate my own understanding. I was completely dependent on an example or something capturing my attention and me latching onto that. And in, in the absence of something like that, you know how in some classes, it's easy to visualize what's going on. It's easy to think of examples. It's easy to sort of tie it to what you already know. And then in other classes, you're like, I don't know, this is just, I don't even know where to, and it's a required class. You have to get through this and, and you don't even know what to do with it. And I was like that in pretty much like all my classes as an undergraduate to start off with. And um, one of the things that I really had to focus on was, okay, what behaviors can I engage in that would be more helpful? What is my goal? Is my goal to like understand the gist of this content? Content is it to understand? Do I need to actually memorize definitions or dates or names? Like, what is my goal? Like, what's my agenda with this study habit, this study practice? Um, what kinds of inputs do I have available? I have a book. I have a lecture I can listen to. Um, I it wasn't until I was a senior. This is another cautionary tale. It wasn't until I was a senior that I started engaging in study groups with my peers. I would strongly recommend getting involved in study groups if you can, because um, though having inputs from another source as your peer tries to explain their perception or understanding of the content and you try to explain your perception, um, that gives you better control over the information. So I would argue, get into a study group. Once I started studying with other people, I started doing it a lot better, started understanding the content a lot better. Um, and so that last step information about the state of the mental processes helps us to look back at those previous three and assess, are these working? Am I, am I actually processing the information in the most advantageous way? Right. And take control of that. So what we're talking about is executive functions. You may have heard the term metacognition. That term refers to, um, the skills that you have in monitoring and controlling your own mental processes. So metacognition is your awareness of these processes that you're going through. Um, here's a little cycle. So, you know, you have to assess the task. Um, think about the strengths and the weaknesses that you may have in your understanding or your ability to think about that task. Plan your approach for, you know, trying to um, boost those weaknesses and make them better. Apply those strategies. Reflect on whether those strategies are working or not. 
reassess the task, see what's left to do, and continue in this cycle until you've actually processed all the information. A lot of us don't think this hard about our thinking, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel sort of like I understand, right? We don't think about, you know, what gaps might be present, um, what we don't know that we don't know, things like that. And so um, some people seem to be more metacognitively aware than other people. I'm not going to argue it's a trait, though. I mean, I think it's something that some people think are more is more important given certain contexts. I'll bet I'll bet everybody displays metacognition in a subject that they really care about. I'm gonna I, I'll bet that. Um, I don't think it's a trait where we differ. Meta memory. So meta actually means sort of awareness. So metacognition is our awareness of our cognitions. Meta memory means our awareness of how our memory system works. And so. Um, we can define it as our knowledge and beliefs about, our awareness of, and our control over our own memory. So um, you've been taking inquisitives where um, one of the things that is present for each of these quizzes is this uh, confidence rating that you're supposed to, to do. And you can risk fewer points if you're not that confident. You can risk more points if you are confident. Um, most students who I talk to honestly say, I just put it at the max and let the chips fall where they may. And I, I would probably do the same thing, honestly, because I am not a big believer that these metacognitive questions really help, that these meta, they, the designers of the uh, online adaptive style quizzes who, who include these, um, call them metacognition. And I'm like, or meta memory. I'm not, <laughs> um, but this question, how confident are you, is supposed to um, be a gauge of, or, or, of how aware you are of what you already know, or maybe trigger you to, um, you know, be aware that you don't, you don't really know this and maybe think about it. Maybe I should go back and read again or something like that. Um, so they're, they're trying to sort of um, elicit more metacognition from students by including this. Um, what I think most of us might spontaneously do that's evidence of meta memory is realize that certain kinds of information might benefit from some kind of mnemonic device, which of course we've already covered in this class. Um, and so you might decide that you're going to make some kind of acrostic about um, the thing that you're trying to memorize or, or make up a rhyme or something like that. That's a good example of meta memory. Um, Again, when I was an undergraduate, I did not have any good study habits. And so one of my shortcomings was I had really no, I had no mnemonic devices. If I couldn't just sort of bulldoze my way into knowing it, force myself to somehow just memorize it, um, I had no strategies. And again, I was a senior in, in college when I was in a, a group um, in physiological psychology, and we were supposed to be memorizing the um, cranial nerves. And my teammates were all physical therapy students, and um, they were the ones who came up with uh, basically an acrostic to to get all twelve cranial nerves memorized. And I try, I was like, "Wow, I've never heard of doing such a thing. This is very interesting." And so I tried to adopt what they were doing. Like everybody agreed to do the same acrostic, and we were all going to memorize it. And I got to tell you what, it so desperately didn't work for me that I, I'm not even confident that there are 12 cranial nerves, let alone, I only know the name of the vagus nerve and the facial nerve. This is what, oh no, there's a, also a trigeminal nerve. Um, that's, I think about all the ner ocular nerve. There's an ocular. Okay. So I think I know four, uh, that didn't work for me. And so knowing that that kind of strategy doesn't work for me is just as important as saying, hey, it exists, I should try it. Those are both examples of meta memory, knowing that that's not a strategy that works for me. Uh, for me, things that I've discovered work really well for me are imagery. If I visualize it, I'm much more likely to remember it. If I can come up with a crazy visualization, that's even better, right? Um, you know, acronyms and acrostics don't work for me, but um, not just rhymes, but actually taking the rhyme and putting it to a tune that I know. That makes it really memorable for me, make up like a little song that I'm supposed to be memorizing. Um, and then other things that I do are just organize the material into ways that it makes sense to me, even if it's not the way that the um, teacher had presented it or the book presents it. 
Um, so finding what works for you is the key thing, right? That's the important thing, not that you adopt some strategy that's been identified. So what I wanted to wrap up this chapter with is that, um, you know, when we talk about consciousness, it brings up the issue of the mind. And uh, when I was a student in grad school, um, studying cognitive psychology, there was um, this distinct avoidance of the word mind. Um, and it made a lot of sense to me once we sort of talked about it in different classes and why cognitive psychologists don't really use the word mind. Um, and it's because of this mind body problem. Um, there's an assumption that there's a separation between your mind and your body in, a, in some way that it's some somehow different. It's, um, I put here that it's a different sort of entity because, you know, your body is physical, but what is your mind? Is it, it's kind of ephemeral right? Like, what is it? Because it, at the minimum, we might argue that it's um, the functioning of your neurons and the way that they're interacting at the moment. And it's so transitory. It's not something that's stably there. It's not like a bucket that has all your mind stuff in it. It's, it's the flaring of all these neurons. So it's, they're separate and they're different entities, but they're interconnected with each other, right? Obviously, the functioning of your actual brain cells is what generates these, this ephemeral mind, Right. And of course your mind and the, whatever you're thinking about at the time can influence how your body's functioning. Of course, it's going to affect your brain directly. And it also can affect things like very distant thoughts that you're having. What was that sound can cause adrenaline to be released, you know, feet away from your brain, right? Where you're having the thought. And so, um, they're interconnected and in, influence each other. Biology influences what you, you know, how your mind or whatever. I don't like to say the word mind. I'm sorry. Um, whatever you're thinking about, and then what you're thinking about can influence the way that your body's functioning. Um, they're associated, right? Because there's a correlation between what your brain is doing and then what your conscious experience of that is, right? Or even your unconscious experience, because sometimes what your brain is doing is, is going into certain brain waves, and that's what we call sleep. Um, so certainly there's an association between our mind and our body. Um, but what's the mechanism? that allows our mind and our body to, to cause changes in each other. Like what exactly is going on? And I have to say, this is like our nice mystery in psychology, in neuroscience, in all these areas, we're trying to figure out how this clearly we all accept that there's a mind, I think, you know, but I was just trained. Don't ever say that word. Don't say mind. Cause what is it? Don't say mind. What is it? So I was trained not to say that. I typically don't say it very much in classes. Of course, in my regular life, I, 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 you know, say mind cause what else is it? It's this thing that's thinking things, right? And so this is a big mystery in, in cognitive psychology, neuroscience, um, you know, religion, you know, is the mind the soul? Hmm. We don't know. Um, so I'm leaving you after 15 chapters with a mystery. Maybe you agree with the training that I had and, and mind, you know, invoking a mind as an explanation of something is, is a tricky thing to do in a really heavily scientific field like cognitive psychology. Or maybe you're like, well, of course there's a mind. That's dumb that you guys would even argue over that. That doesn't make sense. Um, and you are completely right to be thinking either way because um, it's a mystery and we really don't know what to think about this part. So hopefully you've enjoyed your trek through cognitive psychology and I've really enjoyed leading you through it. And so there'll be no more lectures. I know I say I'll see you in the next chapter, but I guess not. Maybe I'll see you in another class. All right. Well, thanks for listening.